What's going on guys, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and we're back with another Unearthed Arcana review. This will be probably, there will be two more here in the month of April with the current series where it is weekly. Then we'll be going back to the monthly, potentially bi-monthly, uh, and then I'll still be doing these videos, they'll just be a little bit more infrequent. Uh, what are we talking about this time? Wizards of the Coast is revisiting downtime. If you're not familiar with what downtime activities are, they are located in two locations. There is a small section towards the back of the player's handbook before you get into combat and spells. There is also a fairly, uh, I wouldn't say, I guess it's not fairly sizable, but a sizable section in the Dungeon Master's Guide that goes over downtime activities. And what is a downtime activity? This is things that your adventurers, your characters can do when they're not adventuring uh, and have essentially downtime so this could be uh, the best example i can give you is things like the adventurer league uh, when an adventure that you're in and you compete and you play in and it ends then your character is awarded downtime days to spend between adventures so let's say uh you play every week at a local shop on wednesdays at the end of adventure one on Wednesday, you get five downtime days. Because your character isn't left in a in a dungeon or in like a typical campaign where you can leave, uh, you know, the game. You know, you're halfway through a dungeon, you stop, or, or something big is going to happen. The adventure league is designed to be contained. So you finish the adventure, then you say, "Oh, I want to spend my five downtime days to do X," uh, and then you come back next week, and whatever you spent those days for, you have now done. You can do this in a homebrew or a home played campaign where, I mean, if you're meeting weekly, you could always say if the story allots, hey, we got to this town, nothing big is going to happen. We're going to say you spend a week in the town. You have a week's worth of downtime days. That was sort of how that's handled. This new Unearthed Arcana gives you a little bit more parameters around that as they call them work weeks. Uh, but that, I just wanted to give you a primer about what I'm talking about before we actually roll into it. So, without further ado, downtime. So, on a typical campaign, it's possible for characters to start at first level, dive into an epic story, and reach level 10 without any, uh, beyond any short amount of time. Well, the pace works fine for many campaigns. Some DMs prefer pauses built in. Um, downtime activities can do that. The options here give and can be used as alternatives to the downtimes that I talked about in the Player's Handbook and the Dungeon Master Guide. I would recommend using these in place. They're more, there's more parameters to them, and they break up some things that could be, kind of go either way. Like carousing was one, drinking and gambling sort of at a bar. You've removed that and put gambling in its own separate thing and carousing as its own separate thing. So first, they talk about foils. So, um, downtime system here is built on two elements, and we'll talk, you know, foils will come up later, but short-term activities, ones that can be completed in a work week, which they're calling five days. These activities uh, cover what characters at levels 1 to 10 might do between adventures, it includes buying or creating magic items, pulling off heists, working jobs. Higher-level characters can do other things as well. Second, this downtime system introduces the concept of foils. Foils are NPCs who oppose the character or whose goals pull them against the party, uh, or put them against the party. A foil might be a villain who wishes to destroy the characters, or a good aligned cleric who sees the characters as meddlers and troublemakers. And then basically it goes through and tells you how to build a foil. Um, the basics, you're basically going to choose an activity uh, based on what it is, and then determine how that's going to go. So. Each activity tells you how to resolve it. Most activities take a certain period of time. If you want multiple weeks to pass the campaign world between sessions, report back the results of any downtime activities and ask for your player, your character's next move. I like that they often are saying, like, you could do this when you meet them in person or shoot a text or an email and have, you know, and I like, not that they need to say this, but I like this encouraging out-of-session conversations between the players and the DM. I think that's good. I think it helps to keep everybody psyched and pumped for the game, and it also is like, oh man, what, what did you do with your downtime? And it gives people little things to talk about. Um, and then complications are the next section, which is more where the foils will come into play. 
Uh, to add flavor, there's, I think, a 10% chance, uh, yeah, that an activity will have a complication. And then there's a table that you can kind of roll on or make up your own uh, of what the complications could be. And some of these can be tied to a foil, and they have a little asterisk to denote that. So foils, NPCs that oppose them. They give you a couple examples. The cultists of Orcus, who plan to foil the characters. An ambitious merchant who wants to rule the city. Priests of Helm, who are convinced the character is up to no good. First step in creating a foil is building an NPC or picking one of your current cast of characters. So you can use your NPCs that you've made, or, or maybe someone that kind of fits this, or make up a new one. Uh, at least one should be a villain. Uh, it's a good idea to have two or three at any time. One is a villain, others might be neutral or good. The conflict with the characters might be social or political rather than direct attacks. The best foils are personal. Find links in the characters' backstories or recent adventures that provide a good explanation of what sparked the foils' actions. The best trouble for the characters is trouble they created for themselves. And it gives you examples of foils here. There's a D20 uh, list of these. We can see, grab a couple here. Number 10, newcomer out to make a mark on the world. 20, corrupt official paranoid that crimes will be revealed. Um, then what is the motivation of them? Think about what's gonna drive them to want to foil the characters. Again, there was examples. They're just evil people or they think they're meddlers. Uh, what is their goal overall? Uh, ideally, the outcome involves the characters or something they care about. The foil wants to take over the town, slay one of the characters, etc. What assets do they have? Is there a small army of obedient fanatics? Um, does it hold any political sway, have any kind of clout that will help impact its decisions? And then there is actions that they've got listed here. Uh, actions should build a path towards achieving the NPC's goals. For each action, make note of what the NPC might change in response to it. What if uh, what it might change, town's politics, blah, blah, blah. Uh, examples of complications given for activities, again, have the asterisks to denote that they may be tied to a foil. Um, and then events. Consider how the campaign setting might shift due to the foil's influence. Uh, imagine the characters do nothing to oppose the foil. What happens next? How does it change the world? Again, not that everybody's going to want to do this, but in my mind, I like to have my world seem like a living world. Things happen whether or not the PCs were there. There's a cool festival in the town. The foil here in this example is doing something. They, if they don't, or they're not there, or they don't recognize that this is happening, that stuff still happens. It's not, since it's in a video game, it's not triggered on a quick time event where the player gets from point A to point B and then the event triggers. This just happens in the world. And if, they, if they're there to experience it, great. If they're not, oh well. But this is making the world seem alive and, and more real and try to get people invested and be like, oh man, we missed that festival. We're going to have to make sure we come back next year. You know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we've got Revise. Remember that foils are characters who change over time. They're not just, again, static NPCs. They can change and adapt to fit the situation. So I'll read through this. I kind of skipped around. I think I pretty much got the gist of it, and I think you guys did too. Uh, but let's read this example, Myron Rodemus. This is an example foil. The Rodemus clan was once, built, uh, was once a small but powerful family of traders, but 30 years ago they pulled up stakes and left town overnight. Now, Myron Nordemus, the family's youngest son, has returned to the city to reclaim his family's place of prestige. In truth, the Rodemuses fled because they had contracted lycanthropy. Absorbed into a clan of were-rats, they liquidated their assets and delved into smuggling in a distant city out of fear that their secret would be impossible to maintain in their home city. Myron fought his way to the topmost ranks of the were-rat clans and, along with an army of followers, has returned to claim his rightful place among the city's elite. If he doesn't succeed, he's, vow he's vowed to leave the city in ruins. His goals? Uh, Myron wants to become the most respected, most important merchant in town, someone to whom even the prince must yield. Assets? He has a small fortune in gold. His, his own skills as a were-rat, alchemist, and necromancer, a group of were-rats that are dedicated to him, the service of twin dwarf sisters who are superb assassins, a shield, dwarf, uh, shield guardian rather that protects him, an alliance with a hobgoblin lord who lives in the mountains outside the city. Action. Myron's works to discredit and ruin other merchants. His whereat spies on his rival and feed information to the hobgoblins, leading them to raid caravans. The whereats sneak into warehouses, unleashing hordes of rats to spoil goods. Myron even throws a few of his own caravans and warehouses away to throw off suspicion. If Myron's plans fail, he has a terrible alternative. 
His knowledge of alchemy has allowed him to breed a deadly plague that he will unleash on the city via hordes of rats. If he can't rule, uh, then no one will. And then here's some plans. Event. Rats become a noticeable problem in the streets with swarms sighted in rundown neighborhoods. Folk demand action to be taken. Action. Caravans raid more and more. Uh, caravan raids become more common and folk talk of gathering a small army to drive the goblinoids away. Myron contributes generously to the effort. Action. Warehouses overrun with rats, ruining thousands of gold pieces worth of goods. Myron blames the city. Guard for lax effort. Action. Should the characters interfere, Myron sends his assassins against them. A sudden storm creates minor flooding, washing dozens of dead, bloated, diseased rats from the sewer. Terror about a plague rifts through the town. Myron fans the, fa uh, fans the flames of panic, spreading rumors that characters of other rivals or, or other rivals in town are responsible for the disease. And then they give the Temple of Flotus here, and then we're going to roll into the downtime activities. So, first of all, there's going to be a lot of things that you're probably going to want to be as a DM or a player. I'm going to think you're going to find this useful. And first up here is buying magic items. Everybody wants magic items. They're some of the coolest things in D&D. Uh, you want them as a player because you want your character to be more powerful and have access to neat things. And you want to give them out as a DM because it makes your players happy. But you don't want to always just have them go through the same kind of rigmarole to get these. What if they just want to buy one? Well, here's some rules. First of all, it requires resources. Magic items are not as rampant as they were in previous editions. Whether you say that that's different in your game, then this doesn't really apply. Uh, or if you do kind of follow what's going on and maybe it's set in the realms, the spell play had a problem with limiting the magic items, whatever it might be. Finding magic items to purchase requires one work week of effort, so five days, and 100 gold minimum in expenses. This is you gathering uh, resources, sending messengers, pooling things to find someone who can sell you the item. Resolution. A lot of these are based on checks, so it also will make uh, a lot of skills and high proficiencies, especially characters with expertise, very useful in this if you choose to use this method. The character makes a persuasion check to determine the quality of the seller found. The character gains a plus one for every work week beyond the first spent seeking a seller, again you only need the one, and plus one bonus for every 100 gold spent after the first. The maximum of this can be plus ten. Uh, shown on the buying magic items table, the total dictates which table you can roll on to determine which items are on the market. Using the magic items table, you then assign prices to the available items based on their rarity. Have the price of any consumable item, such as a potion or scroll, when using the table to determine an asking price. You have final say in determining which items are for sale. If the character seeks a specific magic item, first decide if it's an item you want to allow in your game. If so, include the item among the offerings if it appears on a table that the result allows you to roll on. Oh. Oh, sorry. So... If their total roll equals a 1 to 5, it's 1d6 times the magic item table A, 6 to 10, 1d4 on magic item table B, 11 to 15, 1d4 on magic, table, magic item table C. I'm not going to read through all of these, but it goes to 1d4, and you can see these, the perception check or the persuasion check goes up and up and up, all the way to 41 plus to get on magic item table I. Then, what is the asking price for this? You can see common is a d6 plus 1 times 10. Uh, uncommon is a d6 times 100. To give you an idea, you can look at this and say, well, I could sell an uncommon magic item for anywhere between 1 to 600 gold. Uh, and then 2d10 for rare, so you got a minimum of 2,000 gold, and so on and so forth, all the way up to legendary items, which, based on the price alone, are going to be very rare a legendary for you to be able to purchase one in a store and then here's a list of complications again i'm not going to read through all of these for any of them because there's a lot here but basically the ones with the asterisks might involve a foil the item could be cursed it could be fake it could be a stolen item um someone who had it before wants it back you get the point carousing so this is uh between adventures who doesn't want to relax with a few drinks and a group of friends at the local pub uh, carousing covers a work week of fine food, strong drinking, and socialize, uh, socializing, and you can choose to socialize with the lower, middle, or upper class folks. Character can carouse lower class for 25 gold, uh, 100 gold for middle class, and 500 gold 
for the work week with the no uh, with the upper class, but they have to have access to the local nobility. This also empowers those with the noble uh, character background, uh, unless you have another reason why they would have access to the higher uh, the nobility. Then the character makes a persuasion check using the carousing table, and you can see here a one to five. Uh, is a hostile contact, 6 to 10, nothing happens, 11 to 15 is 1, uh, 16 to 20 is 2, and 21 plus is 3 allied contacts. Contacts are NPCs who now share a bond with the character. Each one owes the character a favor or has some reason to bear a grudge. A hostile one works against the character, placing obstacles but not stopping short of committing a crime or violence. Allied contacts are friends who will render aid to the character but will not risk their lives. A harmful contact might point the town guard in the character's direction or argue with the character who tries to rally the town to a cause. Helpful contacts stand by the character and help in any way possible. Low class contacts include criminals, laborers, and mercenaries, the town guard, and so on. Middle class are guild members, spellcasters, town officials, and other folk who frequent more upscale establishments, and the upper class is nobles and their direct servants. Carousing in this case covers formal banquets, state dinners, things of that nature. Once a contact has helped or hindered a character, the character needs to carouse again to get back into the NPC's good graces. A contact provides help once, not help for life. The contact remains friendly and can influence roleplay and how the characters interact with them, but it doesn't come with a guarantee of help. You can assign specific NPCs as contacts. You might decide the barkeep at the Wretched Gorgon and a guard station at the Western Gate are the character's allied contacts. Assigning specific NPCs gives the players concrete options. It brings the campaign to life and seeds the area with NPCs that the characters care about. On the other hand, it can prove difficult to track and might uh, to track and might render a contact useless if it doesn't come into play. Alternatively, you can allow the players to make NPC contact on the spot after carousing. When the characters are in the area where they caroused, a player can expend an allied contact and designate an NPC they meet as a contact, assuming the NPC is the correct social class based on how the character caroused. Using a mix of the two approaches is a good idea. Same process can be applied to hostile contacts. You can give the character a specific NPC they should avoid or might introduce them to one in an unfortunate or dramatic moment. All characters can have a number of unspecified allied contacts at a time, no higher than one plus their charisma modifier. Specific named contacts don't count towards this limit, only ones that can be used at any time to declare an NPC as a contact. And then again, a list of complications, pickpocketing, etc. Complications are lower class, middle class, and then uh, upper class. So, crafting an item. This is another thing that comes up often. My character has leatherworking tools, masonry tools, armor smithing tools, herbalism kits, alchemy tools, whatever. What, what can I do with these things? And as a DM, you're kind of like, ah, kind of I'll go on the fly and see what happens. This, again, helps you quantify that. I like it. So, resources. To determine how many work weeks it takes to craft an item, divide its cost by 50. A character can complete multiple items in a work week if their combined cost is 50 GP or less. For items that cost more than 50 GP, a character can complete them over long periods of time as long as the work is in progress is stored in a safe location. Multiple characters can combine their efforts, divide the time needed to create the item by the number of characters working on it. As a DM, use your judgment, saying that you can't have a team of workers working to forge a ring, uh, but maybe armor or a cart or a boat, you can have a lot more. The character needs to be proficient with the tools needed to craft an item and have access to the appropriate equipment. As DM, you make the judgment calls, but here's some options. Herbalism kit to make antitoxin and potions of healing, leather workers tools for leather armor and boots, smith tools for armor and weapons, weavers tools for cloaks and robes. Assume the character can sell crafted items in this way at their listed at their listed price. Uh, so there you go. Then there's also crafting magic items. Um, potions of healing and spell scrolls. Uh, for further, for there's more information on how to do those. They treat them separate because they're a little bit easier to make compared to actual magic items. To start with, a character needs a formula for a magic item in order to create it. A formula is basically a recipe. This is kind of carrying over. Uh, it lists materials needed and steps required to make the item. An item invariably requires an exotic material to complete. This can range from the skin of a yeti to a vial of water taken from a whirlpool in the elemental plane of water. 
you have to figure out what the material is as the DM and how they're going to incorporate it into the adventure. But they do give you an idea for a challenge rating of a monster to determine what kind of item they could make. Uh, so, as you can see, an uncommon item would be CR 4 to 8. Uh, rare 9 to 12, 19 plus to make a legendary item. Again, doesn't necessarily mean that defeating a monster would be the way to do it. It may be talking to the monster or something to that effect. Uh, pick a monster location that is thematic for the item. For example, Mariner's Armor might come, require the essence of a water weird. A staff of charging, or charming rather, might need the cooperation of a specific Arcanoloth who will only help the creatures complete a task for it. Creating a staff of power might rely on finding a piece of an ancient stone that was once touched by the god of magic. A stone guarded by a suspicious Andros Sphinx. In addition to facing the monster, creating the item also costs gold, uh, and you need the materials. Uh, those values, as well as time character needs, is on the crafting magic item table. So, crafting that uncommon item that needs to defeat a four to CR 4 to 8 creature requires 200 gold and 5 work weeks. So that is 25 days. Uh, to make a magic item, a character also needs whatever tool proficiency is appropriate, as is normal for crafting any object, or the character needs proficiency in the arcana skill. And then there are complications associated with magic items. Brewing potions of healing. Potions of healing are separate, they fall into a different area. Uh, you can see here, the time and money needed to create such a potion is summarized on the potion of healing creation table. One day and 25 gold to make a healing potion. One work week and 100 gold to make a greater. Three work weeks and a thousand gold pieces to make a superior, and so on. Crime! I liked, I thought this was cool. Sometimes you want to be a bad guy and you want to do bad things and have pull off a heist. Uh, so, and a crime spree requires a character to spend one work week and at least 25 gold gathering information on potential targets and then committing the crime. This one, you choose a DC, 10, 15, 20, or 25. Successful completion of the crime yields a number of gold pieces based on that DC, as shown on the loot value table. To do this, you need to make three checks. A stealth check, uh, a dexterity check using thieves tools, and then the player's choice of investigation, perception, or deception. If none of the checks fail, the character is caught and jailed. The character must pay a fine equal to the potential payout and must spend one week in jail per 25 gold piece value. If one check fails, the heist fails, but the character escapes. If two, sec uh, two checks succeed, the heist is a partial uh, success, meaning half the payout. Uh, and if all three succeed, they earn the full payout value. Uh, 10 is 50 gold, robbing from a, a struggling merchant. 15 DC is 100 gold, robbing a prosperous merchant. And then you can see 25, uh, 1,000 gold pieces, robbing one of the richest figures in towns associated complications. Now we have gambling. Again, this used to be part of carousing. It is now split. Uh, it requires one work week of effort from one character, plus the character can risk 100 gold to a maximum of 1,000 gold, unless you decide that they could be real big spenders and get people that would gamble at a higher level. Uh, resolution. Uh, the, you, uh, the DC is determined at random, and the character makes three checks. An insight check, a deception check, and an intimidation check. The DC is 5 plus 2d10, generating a separate DC for each check. Uh, consult the gambling table results to see how the character does. Zero, lose all money you bet, plus accrue a debt equal to that amount. One success, lose half the money you bet. Two successes, gain one and a half times the amount you bet. And three successes, gain double the amount you bet. Pit fighting for your strengthy types. This requires one work week of effort from the character. Uh, this is basically wrestling, boxing, non-lethal forms of combat. Uh, similar to gambling, the character makes three checks. A, an athletics check, an acrobatics check, and an insight check. Same DC is 5 plus 2d10, and then to consult the pit fighting table. Uh, this has set gold values. Zero successes, you lose your bouts, you earn nothing. One success is 50 gold. Two success is 100 gold, and three success is 200 gold. Uh, relaxation. I thought this was funny. You can use your time to relax. It requires at least one work week. You need to maintain at least a modest lifestyle while you relax to gain these benefits. 
You also need to be staying at a home, an inn, or some other location that can actually afford you rest. What does this do? Uh, you get advantage on saving throws to recover from long-term diseases and poisons. At the end of the week, you can end one effect that prevents you from regaining hit points or restore one ability score that has been reduced to below its normal value unless the harmless, uh, harmful effect is caused by a spell or other magical effect with an ongoing duration. Uh, religious service. This was interesting because the religious service kind of thing before was essentially praying to get inspiration uh, for a number of days. This they went with kind of the similar NPC thing. No work, uh, no gold cost, one work week of time. Character chooses to make a religion check or a charisma check. The result below. 1 to 10 is nothing. 11 to 10 is you earn one favor. 21 plus is you earn two favors. A character is... Uh, a favor is a promise for future assistance. It can be expended to ask the temple for help in dealing with a problem, for political or social support, or to reduce the cost of cleric spellcasting by 50%. At any one time, a character can have a number of unexpended favors, no higher than one plus their charisma modifier. And I like this. You can build favors in towns and cash them in later. Research, another useful one, especially if you're trying to do the magic item thing. Do research on the how to make the item and then build the item. Uh, it requires one work week of work and at least 100 gold worth of materials, bribes, gifts, etc. Um, then you declare your focus, a specific person, place, or thing. After a work week of research, the character makes an intelligence check with a plus one bonus for 100 gold spent beyond the initial 100 gold to a maximum of plus six. In addition, a character with access to a particularly well-stocked library or knowledgeable sages gains advantage on this. Determine how much lore the character learns. 1 to 5, no effect. 6 to 10 is 1. 11 to 20 is 2. 21 plus is 3. Each piece of useful lore is the equivalent of a true statement about a person, place, or thing. Examples include knowledge of a creature's resistances, the password needed to enter a sealed dungeon level, the spells commonly prepared by an order of wizards, and so on. For monsters or NPC, you can reveal elements of stats or personality. For a place, you can reveal secrets about it, such as a hidden entrance, the answer to a riddle, or the nature of a creature that guards it. You also give out specific pieces of information with research, especially if the players want to research a specific thing. Alternatively, a player can track down or can track how many non-specific pieces of lore have been accumulated by their character. At any time during play, the character can expend a piece of lore to learn about a monster, place, person, and so on. That character has sudden insight or calls the relevant information. You can store no more than uh, at one time of one plus your intelligence modifier. Describing a spell scroll. So here we go. This is also useful. Uh, I would say very useful for limited casting classes. Paladins, uh, Warlocks, Rangers, the Eldritch Knight, Arcane Trickster. Um, you uh, takes time and money uh, based on the level of the spell you wish to scribe. You must also provide any material components required by the spell. Moreover, you must have the spell prepared or among your known spells in order to describe it, and you must have proficiency in the Arcana skill. If you scribe a cantrip, the version of the scroll works as if the caster is a first level caster. So here you can see, first level spells is 2 days and 25 gold, second level spells 2 work weeks, it's 10 days, 250 gold, all the way up to 96 work weeks and 250,000 gold to make a ninth level scroll. And then we have selling a magic item. We went through how to make them, and how to craft them, and how to buy them. Now how do we sell one if you have one that you don't want? So you're trying to find a buyer that's going to take at least a work week and 100 gold in expenses to track down the right contacts to sell your item. The character makes a charisma persuasion check to see what kind of offer. The character can always opt to not sell instead of wasting the work week and try again later. So, here are the base prices, 50 gold to sell an uncommon, 200 to sell a common, uh, or, I'm sorry, 50 to sell a common, 200 to sell an uncommon, 2,000 to sell a rare, etc. Then, 1 to 10% uh, on your charisma check, 1 to 10 is 50% of the base price, 11 to 20 is 100% of the base price, and 21 plus is 150% of the base price. Uh, and then again, complications. Training. Uh, this is a little bit more refined for learning how to use a tool or a language. Uh, training a tool, uh, a language or tool takes at least 10 work weeks, but reduce this time by a number of work weeks equal to the character's intelligence modifier. An intelligence penalty doesn't increase the time needed. Training costs 100 gold per work week. 
So if you have a five intelligence, you could learn a new language or how to use a tool in five work weeks, 25 days, and it would cost you 500 gold. I think that's more reasonable. I like that the character's intelligence, it sort of helps to give intelligence a couple of other uses, uh, not necessarily just for wizards and a few classes, but it makes it, I don't know, it makes it feel like intelligence is more valued as a stat. Uh, work. This is the last one here. Uh, when all else fails, go to work and make some money. Uh, to determine how much money a character makes, uh, the character makes an ability check. Strength, athletics, intelligence with some uh, with a set of tools, charisma, performance, or charisma with a musical instrument. Consult the wages table based on the role. Maximum you can do is a 21 plus comfortable lifestyle for the week, plus 25 gold pieces. Um, and there you go, guys. I don't know about you, but I love this. I really like the downtime activity system. I always felt like it needed a little bit of a push, though, and it needed some help. And I feel like this does a great service to it. It makes my life as a DM and as a player a lot easier. I can approach my DM like, hey, did you see the new Onarch Arcana? Hey, you know, I defeated X creature and I took its teeth or I took its claw or its blood or its skin. Um, could we work and say, if I find, if I do research to find out what I need to do and spend the time because I have proficiency in Arcana, can I make whatever the item is? Or, you know, your character is an entertainer, you're a bard entertainer, and you want to work for the week. How much money are you going to make? You have a table to roll on. Or, you know, you've been talking to your party member who is an elf, and he's been trying to teach you elvish, and you can now learn it in your downtime. I don't know, I really like it. I think it's really cool. I'm a fan of these. Uh, I like to see that they've been doing all sorts of different things in the more recent Unearthed Arcana, moving away from... We've seen spells... We've seen downtime, we've seen traps. Now I'm sort of hoping that we're going to get more feats as the next one. I don't know. Uh, feats and weapons. That's my anticipation. Next thing we're going to get feats, uh, maybe weapons, and then maybe like weapons and armor as a combo. Um, we saw feats once before, but I'd like to see a refinement of that. So that's what I say. Feats and then weapons and armor. Anyway, guys, let me know what you think of these. Let me know what you think of my interpretation. Did I screw up on any of this other than me stumbling over my own words? I seem to be doing that a lot today. Uh, but yeah, let me know what you think, and I'll see you next time.